Well, thank you for having me back, Charlie. And uh, let me just say that this is the third time I've been in revival. And apparently after two week-long revivals, you figured one day is enough. And so that's fine. But it's the fourth time I've been here. Because while I did three, there was one time I came and I preached for a pulpit committee. Because I think they freaked out because they thought they were here to hear you and they were here to hear me. Because the church uh, wanted me to, uh, I was at Friendship in Fox Baptist. And they didn't want Friendship to know. Little did they realize that by the time I got from here back to Friendship, everybody in Crockett County knew that I had been here. So, uh, you know, Baptists, we spread the word one way or the other. But um, um, 40 years. I've been ordained 40 years. This is my 40th year back in February. It was marked my 40th anniversary of being ordained. So we've actually known each other longer than that uh, because when I surrendered to preach in 79, so and I can't forget what year you came. And, and um, I, you know, I tell people I have one best friend, and that's him, And because uh, nobody else will put up with me. But uh, I know Miss Charlie. I know he's brother Charlie to y'all, but he's Charlie to me. And, and I just, before I get into to what I'm going to do tonight, and I thought I better do this now, um, uh, I have never had anybody that has meant as much to me as Charlie Halliburton and Susan and all. And, of course, I'm sitting here, and I see, saw Chuck earlier, and he was a little bitty thing first time, you know, so I'm, I'm already feeling older. I turn 68 next Saturday. And uh, so, uh, but Charlie and I have gotten to be good friends. We're not, don't see as much as each other as we did when I was in Dyer. So say much to the, the happiness of Susan, because I'd come over the house and just, we'd sit around all day and Susan say, Charlie, you've got things you got to do. And, you know, because <laughs> Charlie and I would sit and we would talk all day. And uh, because it just, we're just best friends, but uh, he's always been there for me. When we lost our son, you were there. When my mom died, you were there, and uh, you've always been there in the good times and the bad times. I appreciate you so much, and uh, uh, I know you're sorry that my mother-in-law can't make any more of that ketchup or whatever she used to make anywhere. She's 92, so she can't, but I just want to tell you I love you, and this may not be the last time I get to preach here, but I want to tell you thank you, Charlie, for asking me to come. Uh, you are special to me. And you always will be. And uh, so I'm going to stop right there before I get a little bit teary-eyed and I can't go on to one I want to share. But thank you again for letting me come uh, and, uh, and be here. Uh, I, Charlie said, do I say where you're from? Because Char it's not Charleston, Tennessee, and it's not Charleston, South Carolina. Everybody thinks my church is in South Carolina. It is not, or Missouri. It is not. Uh, we have a Stanton, Tennessee address, and we don't even live in Stanton because Stanton's in Haywood County but we're closer to their post office. So it's confusing to everybody, And uh, but I just say we're from Tipton County, and so we're right outside Covington. But I've been there over 12 years now, and so God's been good to us and continue to be that. I invite you to take your Bibles and open to Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 through 7. Uh, uh, I prayed about what to bring, and, and, and I had a couple other sermons, and the Lord won't let me get away from this one. I will warn you that if this one doesn't work, I got two more here, and I got a notebook full out in my truck. So, so we'll just keep you in mind. But no, God has just put this message on my heart and that to share with you. And uh, so, uh, follow along as I read in uh, chapter two of the book of Revelation, beginning with verse one. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things: says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. And nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen... Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. 
Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for your inspired and errant word. We thank you for Jesus, the salvation that we have full and free through Christ alone. Father, we thank you for those who are here tonight. And Father, I thank you for the leadership of your Holy Spirit in giving me this message to share this evening. Father, I pray as your word says, may he that has an ear hear what the Spirit of God says. And so, Lord, forgive me of all my sin tonight. Hide me behind the cross that people will not see me, but they'll see and hear Jesus tonight. And when we come to the end of this message, Lord, and the time of decision comes, I pray people will make those decisions. They'll be glad they made when they stand before you someday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The message I'm sharing with you tonight is actually part of a series I've already begun in my church on the seven churches. I titled the series, Postcards from Patmos. You've got to have something cute. And because this is what it's about. It's all about the seven churches from in Asia Minor, in Revelations 2 and 3. And the book of Revelation, which is a tremendous book written by the Apostle John while he was exiled in Patmos for preaching the gospel. And while, this, and while on this island prison, God gave John a vision of the future concerning the last days and the return of Christ. He talks about that. He talks about that in, the, in chapter 1, verse 19. He gives us an outline, right? The things you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after. That's an outline of the book of Revelation right there. Chapter 1, the things which were, that you have seen. The things which are, chapters 2 and 3, from chapter 4 to the end of the book is all future. Revelation is the only prophetic book in the New Testament. Now, there's prophecies throughout the New Testament, but Revelation is the only pure prophetic book that we find in the New Testament. And the question is, who's sending these letters? Well, it's not John, it's Jesus. It's the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars represent the angels or the messengers of the churches. And this refers to pastors. I once heard someone say that it's great to hear that pastors are called angels. A lot of times we're called other things besides that. But notice that the lampstands represent the churches themselves. And so you see Jesus, he's holding the pastors in his mighty right hand as he stands in the midst of the churches. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of the theology around these seven churches tonight because I want to focus on the message of Ephesus. But I'll just say this to you, that these seven churches are real churches that existed in John's day, and they also are representative churches they re that reveal characteristics of all kinds of churches throughout history as well as for today. And so what I'm doing in my series and I want to do tonight is I want to focus our attention on what Jesus expects of his church and also on what he rejects concerning his church. Elmer Towns said this. He said, we can readily see that these seven churches comprise seven methods of attack by Satan on the church or on individual Christians within the church. The church at Ephesus is the same church that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to. Ephesus is the only church in the Bible that had letters from two apostles, Paul and John. And so as I share with you tonight about this church, the first thing I want us to do is see the recognition of the church, the recognition of the church. Jesus says, I know your works. That's a phrase that he repeats on all seven churches. And as a reminder to us that Jesus knows everything there is about us. It doesn't matter whether the preacher knows. You may, cover, you may keep it from him. You may keep it from your family. You may keep it from your friends. You may keep it from your boss. You can't keep it from Jesus. He knows everything. And church, he knows all about your church too. He doesn't have to go to the association and find out what the church is all about. He doesn't have to look at your ACP. Your, that's your church letter, we used to call them. Now we got that big name we call them now, your church profile, your annual church profile. Jesus knows everything there is because nothing is hidden from him. So what can we say about this church? He has some good things to say. First of all, they were engaged in the task. They were busy. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. This was a church that was busy doing the things of God. This is a church that had a full schedule. I tell you, if you were looking for a church that had something for everybody, Ephesus would have been your church. 
They had a full schedule of planning and witnessing and ministering. I mean, they would have had something going on. They would have had multiple services on Sunday. They might have had services on Saturday. They had all kinds of things. You get through a church on Sunday morning, they got something going on Sunday afternoon. They got things going on the week. They got discipling programs. They got the women are meeting for something here. We're having a youth thing over here. We're having the children meet over here. You can imagine all different kinds of things about this church. And if you'd gone around and asked, oh, this would be the church anybody would want to go to because there's excitement there. They're busy. In fact, the idea here is that they were working to the point of exhaustion. But they were a busy church. They were engaged in the task. You could have found other churches, but if you'd gone, and, and they would have probably been in the top 100 of the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board churches. Oh, you would have had them speak at the annual meetings. You would have had them speak, their pastors come and talk at the conventions about how successful their church is. And everybody would have said, oh, that's a church, that's a great church there at Ephesus. They're doing a lot of great things down there. It's a busy church. Do you know something, folks? Too many people in our churches today want to be entertained rather than involved. You know, they, they come to church and uh, they're looking to be entertained. They, they want the, the music to be all snappy, you know. Maybe a few lights and pyrotechnics would be good, you know. I don't know if churches do that, but I joked with a guy one time. I said, maybe you can improve your church if you like them wrestlers when they come in. All them, <laughs> Boy, I, I thought about having that in my church. They didn't like that idea of just me coming in like one of them, you know, coming in like that, you know. But having all that and the preacher gets up and he stomps and snorts and does backflips and somersaults and all that. Boy, that was exciting. What did you get out of it? I didn't get anything out of it, boy. It was good. They'll put a couple of dollars in to pay their admission, and then when the 60 minutes is up, they're ready to go. But, oh, if you don't entertain them, I haven't been fed. You know, you didn't entertain me enough. You see, the problem is they have neither the time nor the inclination to get their hands dirty, to get involved in ministry. So the church was engaged in the task, but they were also established in the truth. They didn't let anything or anyone get past them without it being tested. The, the, Jesus says there to them, says that you've tested those who say they're apostles or not. You want to come into the membership of your church? In the average Southern Baptist church, if you can walk, if you're breathing, we'll accept you. You know, we've always, I've heard it said all through my ministry, the easiest thing to join is a Baptist church. The hardest thing to get off out of is a Baptist church. We keep you on the membership after you're dead. Oh, I've had churches, you know, we had people, oh, how long? They've been dead for 10 years. Well, we keep their name on there anyway. Maybe they'll send a tithe. <laughs> but we have all these people on there. But they didn't do that. You come to their church, share with me your salvation experience. What do you believe concerning the Bible? Do you believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God? Do you believe in the deity of Christ, the virgin birth? They would have drilled them, grilled them on that. Because they wanted to make sure, okay, if they'd said something wrong, no, from people to preachers, they're examining them all. They tried every spirit to see if they were of God. They were, we would call them an orthodox church. They had it down. They were making sure that no sheep and wolves clothing got in. Then they renounced the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The word Nicolaitans means conquering of the people. Some believe this was a sect that was the forerunner of clerical hierarchy imposing their will at the cost of spiritual freedom. Others said they were promoting extreme license. may have been a combination of those two. But it says here that Jesus says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus didn't say he hated the Nicolaitans. He said he hated their deeds. And this teaches us that we are to hate what God hates and we're to love what God loves. You see, the world doesn't understand that. We're to love people. We're to share with people. Someone comes to your church and they've gone through a broken marriage. We are to love on them. We're to help them. Someone comes in and, and they're dealing with some kind of addiction. We need to try to find a way to help people and try to encourage them, help them to find hope in Christ, but help them through the difficulty. Sometimes we're good at pointing fingers, but not providing help. You know, Dr. Adrian Rogers once said, a lot of times we have young women come, they're talking about abortion, and sometimes our attitude is we actually push them toward the abortionist. We need to give them hope. We need to give them help. 
We need to show them the love of Jesus. We don't compromise. Jesus never compromised the word. Go and sin no more. But he showed compassion. And I'm afraid sometimes that's lacking in some of our churches. Sometimes we just want to just point at their sin and we don't want to talk about the help in the center and trying to love them. I, I had, you know, I've had people times in my ministry that, that the way they came to know Christ was I showed a genuine concern for them. I had a man one time that got saved. He told me, he said, Brother Mike, if you'd come to my church, first, or to my house, first time you knocked on the door, if you'd come in there preaching to me, I never would have gotten saved because I've had that. I've had preachers come and just get on me, but you just came and you just wanted to be my friend, and that's true. You know, some people might say, oh, you should have shared the gospel the first time you met him. No, I just got in there and got to be his friend. We'd talk about everything in the world, and, and I just talked to him, and, and I didn't pressure him. I'd just say, uh, look, I'd love to have you at church sometime. And then I'd come back, but I earned the right to come back. And after a while, he came to know Christ. His wife came to Christ. He later became a deacon in the church. You know, you love them. You love them into heaven. You love them, and that's how you try to reach people like that. So we need to do that. We need to share with people. The church here, they, they refused to harbor sin, but they still love people. And then thirdly, they endured the trials. It was not easy to minister in, in a culture that, was so, that so much contradicted the word. Ephesus would understand what we're in today. They were in a time of, of, uh, of paganism. Ephesus was a center of pagan culture. We've sort of been in the middle of pagan culture, we would say. You look at our nation today, you look at our world today, it is increasingly becoming more anti-Christ. It is becoming more and more hostile to the gospel. Uh, just saw something on the news, and, and Franklin Graham posted something on Facebook about it as a, uh, a preacher uh, up in Canada. You may have seen it. Uh, he uh, didn't want to shut down. He wanted to keep kept his doors open, even though they said, we're going to make you close your doors. You've got to close your door because of COVID. And he kept on. He, he, had been, he was a Polish-Canadian. And uh, they came to his church. He told them to get out. You don't have a court order. And uh, so he went out of the country. And when he came back in, they were waiting for him at the, at the airport. And they arrested him, put him in handcuffs, you know, for violating things. Religious freedom. Franklin Graham said, I may not agree with everything the man stands for, but, I, but the fact is, here they are threatening religious freedom, and it could come to us, folks, in there. I, I got to, we, we're taking a group to Celebrators, which is a senior adult conference up in Gatlin, uh, Pigeon Forge, next Sunday and, and leaving for next week. And um, David Jeremiah taught, was always there, and, and he was talking about how the struggles they had in this past year in California, or the previous year, and uh, that they threatened, you know, hey, we're going to shut off your power, you're going to shut off everything, but they continued to stay focused on standing on the truth and being the word. And so here's a church. They endured. They had their share of criticism. They had their share of opposition, but they didn't give up. Quit was never in this church's vocabulary. No matter how difficult, they kept on doing the work that God had commended them to. Folks, it is so easy to want to go with the flow in today's culture today. But we must faithfully stand for the truth regardless of the outcome or what the backlash may be. Because, folks, let me tell you something. Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And who here wants to say, I'm better than Jesus? I'm not. You know, Jesus, I just prayed. I told my people, I said, I, and I've said this for years. I said, there's going to come a day when it's going to be unpopular to be a Christian in the United States. And I didn't think I'd live to see it. But I'm willing to see it today, what we see in our culture today. So that we find the recognition of the church. But then there's the remorse concerning the church. In verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Two things Jesus had remorse over. Number one, he had remorse over leaving their love. In spite of appearing almost perfect. I mean, look, look, the first Baptist church of Ephesus would have been the place to go. People probably would have driven their buses in. People would have come from out of town. I want to go to that church. Yet for... And, and, in spite of how almost perfect this church looked, they had one serious flaw. They had left their first love. Now, if you had asked them, they'd say, do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. 
I love Jesus. They'd sing all the songs about loving Jesus. But Jesus said, you've left your first love. The word left implies a definite intentional departure. It's the same Greek word that is used to refer to a man divorcing his wife. He left his first love. Now, what do we mean by this, first love? They no longer had the fervency or the depth of love for Jesus they'd once had. Now, as I did a study on this more, I learned something that I hadn't even thought about. This was a second-generation church. Remember, Paul wrote to this church more than 30 years earlier. So more than 30 years have passed since Paul wrote to this church. Paul's long since been dead. So this book, Revelation, written around, around 80, 90, somewhere in that area. So it's been 30 years. So here's a generation that's a second generation of believers in this church. And while they continue to labor for Christ, the fervent love of that first generation is missing. That first generation. We can serve and suffer for Jesus, but not truly love him. Warren Wiersbe said, labor is no substitute for love, neither is purity a substitute for passion. And one of my concerns as a pastor, as I look and I see the older generations, and I am, I am one of them now, you know. I am one of them senior adults. I've got my AARP and my Medicare, okay. I'm, I'm one of you. But I think about, we're going off to sea. People who have been faithful in churches over the years, and then I see generations come up that don't have the commitment to Christ. Oh, they're saved. They profess Christ as their Savior, but they don't have the passion for Jesus that my generation has had or the generation before me, who every time the doors were open, they were there. They served, they supported because they loved Jesus. There's that passion. And that's what I think we see here at this church. So they were losing that passion. Oh, I tell you what, that's the worst thing that can happen to you as a church. And I got to thinking about this. You know, when, when we think about bad churches, what do we think about in, when it comes to Revelation? Laodicea, don't we? Oh, I tell you what. That Laodicean church, they were so blind, they didn't even know that Jesus wasn't even in the church. He's outside knocking on the door. Behold, I stay at the door and knock. That's terrible. But you know what occurred to me as I was studying this? Isn't it just as bad or maybe even worse to say you love Jesus, but you've left your first love and you don't even realize it? That you've lost your passion for Christ and you don't even realize you've lost it. The passion is gone. But not only was there remorse over leaving their love, there was a remorse over losing their life. You know, once you lose your first love for Jesus, you're in danger of losing your life. That is your testimony. And Jesus said that I'll remove your lampstand. You know, when a church ceases to love, it loses its effectiveness. And it gives the wrong impression of what true Christianity is. And when the lampstand is removed, all that's left is darkness. Imagine a room that's got one lamp in the middle of it. It's on and it's shining light all through that room. Every corner, every part of that room is illuminated. Take that light out of the room and all you have is darkness. Darkness. And when the lampstand is removed from the church, the light no longer shines from that church. And the lost remain in darkness. How can you be the light of the world when Jesus is taking your lampstand? How many churches have there been that have lost their lampstand and they don't even realize it? They've gone out there and they no longer have a testimony. They don't have a positive testimony. They're never, no longer impacting the world for Christ because the light's gone out. And the sad thing is they don't even realize it. So what's the remedy for the church? That's point number three. And we're going to bring it all to a close here in a few minutes. Well, he gives us an outline. Jesus knew some Baptists were going to preach this, so he gave a three-point outline, and it all starts with the same letter, the R. So he knew it would make it easy on us Baptist preachers to alliterate. So here's what he said. First of all, he said, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Literally, it means keep on remembering. Remember. See how far you have fallen. Remember. 
when you had a true passion for Jesus Christ. Remember when you first got saved? Oh, you were so excited. You were ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. I remember when I got saved, we, me and some of the other young people in our youth group got saved First Baptist in Ripley, Tennessee. We got in my car. I was one of the few people who had an old Chevrolet. I was old enough to drive. We'd jump all in my car, and we'd go up on the square around Ripley where other people hung out. I probably was nuts doing that, but we thought about it. We want to tell people about Jesus. We were bold. We didn't care. We just wanted people to know about Jesus. We're excited about Jesus. Somewhere down the road, that excitement's gone. You know, you, you date that special person who becomes your spouse. You know, ladies, you look at him when you start dating him. Oh, he's that big hunk of hunk of burning love. You know, you just, whew, man, he's good looking. And guys, you look at that wife of yours, who, to be your wife, prettiest thing in the world, no woman more beautiful. Oh, you just love being around each other, being together. You got married. Had the honeymoon, and the honeymoon just didn't think it ever end. Oh, you're just on love. You're just around each other all the time. Honey, I love you. Oh, I can't tell you how much I love you. I love you. I love you. But then as the years go by, that changes to I love you. And then love you. And finally, there's a grunt and what's for supper. <laughs> now, you still love your spouse. But the honeymoon's over, right? Sometimes I say, you don't have that passion somewhere down the line. Your love has sort of cooled down a little bit. Oh, I'll tell you what, that what Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that first time passion that you had. I had a guy that led to Christ, and as soon as he got saved, he wanted to be in church every time the doors opened. He wanted to be. He couldn't understand. He come to me and say, "Brother Mike, I don't know why people don't want to be in church." He'd come and tell me about people he witnessed to. Now I want you to know, folks. You want to make your pastor happy? Tell him you've been talking to somebody about Jesus. You want to give him a heart? No, don't, no, I don't want you to do that. But you want to really excite him? You want to see him do something and get happy feet? Bring somebody down the aisle and say, Brother Charlie, I led Joe here to Christ. And he's coming on professional faith. Woo! You get happy feet with that. That's exciting because that's what the church is supposed to do. So remember when you had that fact. Remember when you used to go fishing? And you get out in your boat and you're just sitting there and just enjoying. You don't really care if you catch anything. You're just out there fishing. You know, that's what fishing's all about, just having a, being out there and you're, you're out in your boat. And after a while, you look around. Where am I? I was way down. Where, how did I get way down here? Well, the boat just drifted, didn't it? You didn't even notice it drifted. That's how what happens in our love for Jesus. We were in love with him up here. But somehow down the road, we drifted, and we got away from Jesus. Now, let me say this also before I move on. If you've never had that kind of passion that I'm talking about, you've never been in love with Jesus like that, maybe you need to reexamine your salvation experience, you know, whether you've truly been born again. Now, I'm not saying you have to have emotion to get saved. I'm not saying that I didn't have an emotional experience. But there's a change that takes place in your life, and there's a love for Jesus that comes in your heart. And you want to have that love that's there. And if it's not never been there, then you need to reexamine your situation with Jesus. John Walward said, so often spiritual defection, whether of mind or heart, comes from forgetting that which once was known. So remember where you've fallen from. Secondly, repent. Confess your sin to God and tell him that you want the fire back in your soul. Go to him and say, Lord, I don't love you like I used to. That can be a hard thing to swallow, to say that. But you need to. You have to be honest with him. Why? Because he already knows. Lord, there was a time when I was on fire for you. I really loved with you all my heart. And somehow my heart's gotten cold. I know I'm saved, but I've lost the fire. Oh, Lord, help me to fall in love with you all over again. Revive me in my heart. And then he says, go on and repeat. Go back and do what you did when you first fell in love with Jesus. You see, true love for Christ produces works. But the problem with the Ephesians is they were not working because of their love. They were doing it out of some obligation, some duty. Well, 
if nobody else will teach that Sunday school class, I guess I'll do it. I know you've never said that or heard that before. Well, I guess I'll show up for church or the pastor's going to make me look guilty. Yeah, I guess I'll sing in the choir because if I don't, the music director is going to give me that evil eye every Sunday because he knows I should be up here. So I guess I'll do it, you know, and I guess I'll do this because the preacher's making me feel guilty. I'm a Baptist, and this is what we're supposed to be doing. So we just do things. Why? That's what they were doing. They were going through the motions because that's the thing we do, you know. I dare say you ask the average Baptist why we do things the way we do, they can't tell you. Well, we've always done it that way. By the way, there's one good thing about the pandemic I discovered in the last two years. My church found out that it's a lie. You can do things you've never done before. You know, going on using Facebook Live, going and moving into our, our family life center. We had to do that when we were meeting in person, doing a lot of different things. We started having songs on, on, the, on screens because we didn't use our hymn books. We had never done that before. They found out, hey, we can do things. Change isn't that bad. I didn't blow up and die when the church changed something. Folks, we haven't had a bulletin at Charleston Baptist Church in over a year, and not a single church member has missed it. Well, I have one of his, but nobody has died. And it really didn't make any difference. I told my dignity, I said, they don't read it, and if they read it, they don't pay attention to it. You know, I've read it, and, uh, you know, put it on a screen. I don't remember we did that, okay? So you got to love, but we have to go back and love the Lord. A loveless church is a lifeless church, and a dead church is of no use to God. So the question is, did the Ephesians learn from this? No, not really. Now, the church did continue for centuries, but eventually the light went out in Ephesus. And today, Ephesus is just a heap of stones, and there's no Christian witness there. Dr. A.J. Gordon once said that churches are dying of respectability and being embalmed with self-complacency. We need to fall in love with Jesus again. We have lost the joy and the fervency for Christ. Oh, the work is going on, but what's the motivation? Because you see, some serve out of a legal obligation when we should serve out of a loving adoration. How many of you have children? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. Don't worry, I'm not going to put you on the spot. How many of you have grandchildren? Grand, great, grand, I know you've got 10,000, so I know that. Now, I don't have any grandchildren all, so I don't know. I have been told that grandchildren are so much fun that their parents have wished they'd, they'd had the grandchildren before they had their kids, that they're just grand. Uh, David Jeremiah says he loves his grandkids. He's got over 12. He doesn't like them all at the same time. He said the greatest thing about his grandkids is watching them taillights leave the house. I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> but you love your children. And I know you really love grandchildren because I've seen grandparents, what they do. You would do anything for your kids. Because you love them. You do anything for those grandchildren because you love them. Anything you could do for them, you would, you would go up the mis swim the Mississippi River. You'd do anything in the world to, for them. You would sacrifice anything for them because you love them. So tell me this. Why won't you do that for Jesus? Why don't we do that for Jesus? If we say we love him then why aren't we saying, Lord, whatever it is, I love you. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what I have to do. I love you, and I want to do something for you. I do it out of love. That's what the church needs to be. That's what we all need to be. And it starts with repenting, remembering, repenting, and then repeating. Family Baptist Church, don't let the light. Don't let the light go out. God's put you here. And God has blessed you. And you can say, I love Jesus, but do you love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all that you are? See, that's the kind of love we're supposed to have. And if you can't honestly say, I've got that kind of love, 
and you need to go re-examine yourself. As a child of God, you need to repent, rededicate yourself to Christ. Say, Lord, send a fire. That's what revival is. That's what revival is. It's falling in Jesus, in love with Jesus all over again. And if you're in that shape tonight, I encourage you to make that decision, to recommit to Christ. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, tonight is the time to accept him. There is nothing in the Bible about getting saved tomorrow. It's all about today. Dr. Harold Wilmington used to talk about the doctrine of today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the time we get saved. Not tomorrow, not tonight, not later on. You need to get saved now. Because the only thing you're guaranteed, folks, is right now. Right this very moment. You say, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. That's nice. Goodness won't get you to heaven. I'm a church member. I'm a baptized Baptist. I can tell you from firsthand experience, that won't save you either. Because I used to be a Baptist lost as a goose, member of First Baptist Ripley, dunked in the baptistry, shook hand with the preacher, said yes, got voted on, lost as a goose. Never had anyone share the gospel with me. It wasn't until a few years later that I got saved. So I know what I'm talking about. You can be a member of a church and go to hell. You can be a good person and go to hell. The only way that you can go to heaven is by putting your faith in Christ. And let me tell you that heaven is just a, an extra benefit from, as far as I'm concerned because getting saved means you have a new life. Every Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Oh, I tell you what, he makes you new. He wipes the slate clean. Don't you, wouldn't you like to just have to go in and just say, I'd like to wipe out everything I've ever done, just erase it and start all over? That's what happens when you're born again. In God's eyes, he wipes the slate clean. You become new. And you start, you start enjoying heaven right here. You know what earth is? Earth is practice for heaven. And by the way, Christian, let me tell you, there's one thing you can do on earth you can't do in heaven. You know what it is? Tell somebody else about Jesus. You can't do evangelism in heaven. Everybody in heaven's saved. So this is where you get to do that, here. But all the worship and everything, this is for us for getting us ready for heaven. We need to be involved, loving our Jesus at the throne, adoring him, worshiping him every day. But if you're lost, you need to come to Christ, and you need to come today. God does not send people to hell. People choose to go there. God gives you a choice. He puts before you life and death. He says, it's not my will that any should perish, but all come to repentance. But it's up to you to make the choice. God didn't make hell for you. He made it for the devil and his angels. But if you die without Christ, if you choose to reject Christ and die in your sin, you have chosen to go to hell. Now, you got all of heaven, and then you got the torments of hell. Why would you want that when you can have heaven? And it can never be taken away from you. He'll never leave you, forsake you. He is always there. Doesn't mean life is perfect. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have troubles. But I can tell you from personal experience that even in the darkest times of life, Jesus is always there. And he is the rock. And he has been my shield. And he has been my savior and my comforter and my helper all throughout my Christian life. And I've never been sorry for one day that I've ever been saved. I'm thankful. I'm sorry for the times I failed him but I've never been sorry that I trusted him. And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted him, come to Jesus tonight. Come to Jesus. Father in heaven, I pray right now. In the